Hi again, Adrian Cosman Jones here from Onsite Helper. This video I'll be running you through G Suite security, in particular what to look for with scam emails. Um, some common scam tactics uh, the scammers try to do to trick people. We'll be running through password best practices, how to see if your credentials have been leaked on the internet, and also how to safely protect your accounts by using advanced login protection. One of the most common uh, scam emails we see um, affecting G Suite or Gmail clients are, are ones which are called phishing emails. And what these emails are designed to do is basically be sent to someone and trick them into clicking on a link, um, often sharing like a Google Doc or a sheet file. And when they click on that link, it takes them to like a Google, Google login page, which looks identical to, to your regular Google login. And then when you that person logs in with those credentials, then that scammer uh, gets that login. I'll show you an example of one of these emails. Um, so here we can see it's been sent to, we've just um, muted out the, uh, the person for privacy reasons, but things to look out for them with this particular email, they've obviously said I've shared this particular file with you, looks like a Google file. If you were to hover over that link, um, it would act, wouldn't actually show the correct uh, Google Drive path. Instead, it will probably have something which looks a bit similar, but it'll be a different URL. So it's not going to have the correct google.com um, in the path file name. So that's a dead giveaway that this, this particular um, email is a scam. Um, so make sure whenever you receive emails, before you click on a link, just hover over the, uh, the link and just read what the URL address reads. Um, and just make sure it looks looks okay. The, other, the same thing you can do with the email addresses. Often the email addresses aren't um, exactly correct. They might have a word slightly different um, or a letter. Um, so again, just scan those very carefully. Other ways uh, cyber criminals uh, try to trick people is, is quite targeted. Where, I'll show an example, where they'll actually look for a particular uh, business and target them specifically. So let's say if I type in Construction Melbourne. I'll just look up for a local business here. Um, someone that ranks pretty high. So this one here. Let's look up Kane Constructions. So what this is called is social engineering, where they'll do a bit of research on a business and try to find out ways they can um, extort money uh, out of that company. So what they'll do is I'll go on their website, um, have a look uh, for. Uh, here we are. So what, what do we got here? Executive team. So they want to find someone quite high, high up in the business to target. Um, and often it'll be someone in finance. So let's say financial controller David. And they might use someone else to ask for a money transaction, which could be, uh, let's say, one of the managing, managing directors, Tristan. So they'll use a software which can basically send out an email pretending they're someone um, and asking someone else for payment really. And to do that, you know, there's many of them out there, but let's just try to find one now. I'll just type in email spoofing tool, because that's really what it is. And any of these should probably do it. Let's try this one here. So, yep, with this software here, I can just say I am, here we go here. Just copy him. I'm Tristan. And I can just guess his email would be, this is his domain name. it's likely to be his email. Uh, obviously they can send it to a few different email addresses um, and again we'll try David the financial controller. Um, and we'll just ask for um, please pay invoice. Okay. 
And here you'd say, please make payment for this invoice. And then you'd attach a file or even better send a link. Um, or the, in, the, the file could just be a, um, an invoice file to you know, the, the cyber criminal's bank account. Um, and that's pretty much it. You just click send. Um, and in this case, uh, I'll just put in my email address just to show that it works. Um, so in this case, instead of a, um, David would have received it, but in this case, I'll receive it. And we just and it will be coming from Tristan. Obviously, I don't have Tristan's login details. Uh, and then just click send. So now if I open up my email, and here's that invoice. Well, please put this invoice, and obviously I didn't put the attachment, but it would come through. So it's come from David at kane.com.au, so that all looks legit. Um, yeah, you'd be easily fooled by this particular email. So that's the other way um, scammers can social engineer by pretending they're your own existing staff and asking for a payment. So it's very important before making any payments to double check, especially if it's a new bank account. Um, so if anything seems a bit dodgy, um, yeah, that's an easy way scammers can, can do this type of thing. So your first line of defense is really your password and having a really good password is very important. So here's some examples of good versus bad passwords. Obviously you can see you, you got your really bad ones, which are the passwords, admins, and people's first names. Uh, slightly better is if you include some numbers and symbols and excellent if they're completely random with you know no word involved it's just random text and numbers and letters you also really want to have uh, separate passwords for every single service so you're not using the same password for multiple logins that's really bad practice and it's also recommended not to actually change your password regularly as previously was thought because research says that when you've got a password policy that let's say resets every few months, uh, people tend to always choose a password which was similar and they always make the passwords very simple because um, obviously it's, it would be very hard to every few months remember a new completely strange password. You'd, it'd be much easier to remember a very weak password. So you'd obviously be using weak passwords uh, every time you have to reset them. If you do use the same email address and password for multiple things, I'd highly recommend doing an online check to see if your email account has been uh, hacked with any of the services, service providers. Um, in that way, it would probably indicate that you should actually change your password to something more secure. To do that, you can just type in the uh, have I been torn, T-W-N-E-D, which means have I been hacked. <laughs> um, just go to the first website here. And you just chuck in your email address. And just click on torn. And then this does a quick search on all the databases for known, um, known hack events. Um, and basically tells you all the providers and we'll say this particular service provider in July 2018 they got their credentials hacked 126 million email addresses and passwords Panva uh, there's a few others so if I knew I was using the same password during these dates then it's most likely that cyber criminals uh, have my email address and password and then they, they then sell it and on the dark web and other people will try to hack into my different accounts using those same credentials. So that's a good way to determine if your credentials have been leaked on the internet. As you can see, passwords can be quite insecure and can be a bit out of your control, especially if they're hacked on websites which you're not in control of. So you really need additional layers of security. Uh, that's where a thing called multi-factor authentication or two-step verification comes into play, where it requires an additional thing as well as your password, usually something that you physically have on you, which could be uh, a security key, uh, a token generator, or a mobile phone, which generates a number or requires an authentic or, or an app to allow you to access. Um, so to set this up on your Google account, 
when you just go into your settings, we click on your name at the top right hand corner, uh, go to manage your Google account, click on security, just a verification, get started. So you just have to put in your password again. So if you set this up before, it will already recognize one of your mobile phones. So if that's the correct phone, you can choose that. Otherwise, you can choose another option. Um, and it will send a text to the mobile phone um, and then authorize that particular device. Or you could, like I say, have a security key as well. So in this case, my phone's already configured. So we'll click Try It Now. So what this then does is it um, sends a notification to my mobile and I'll just click across to here. So as you can see, um, it's just popped up on my phone to say, do you want to sign in? I'll just click yes to allow that device. If I shuffle across now, then it's gone to the next option. Now it's asking for a backup code, backup option. So it can send, if, if you don't have this particular uh, phone on you um, you could have a text message or a phone call go to a different number but I wouldn't actually recommend that um, the reason for that is some cyber criminals can actually trick your phone provider um, they can call up let's say Optus or Telstra and say that pretend that they're you and organize for your phone to be diverted to their phone so just like a forward type thing so had they get your email address and password, they can now redirect your two-step verification to go to their mobile phone via a text or a phone call, and then they'll get that code to be able to, to log in. So the more secure option is to use a backup option. And you can just basically print these numbers out and keep them in your wallet or at your desk or somewhere secure. And these codes will be like a one-time code, which can get you back into your, your Google account should you have lost your mobile phone. Uh, yep, so I've got my codes and then just simply turn it on. So that's it. If I was to log into my Google account now, it'll prompt me on my mobile phone um, to authorize that device. You can tell your device to remember you for 30 days, so it doesn't bog you every time. But if you jump on a new laptop, new computer or new phone, it will prompt you straight away because that's a new device. So that's why it's very secure. And in fact, all the years that we've been enforcing this for our clients, we've never had any clients um, compromised when they've got two-step verification enabled. Uh, but we've had heard many, many stories of clients which don't have this and they do get hacked quite a lot. So this thing is very, very close to 100% uh, protecting your, your account. So highly recommend you and all your colleagues enforce two-step verification. Other ways you can lower your risk of being a target attack is to review the way you communicate, especially when you're out of the office. A particular way to do that is within your email, if you go into your settings, you want to be careful with your out of office message. So obviously if you go on holidays, um, you're probably going to be putting a out of office notification, which is this type of thing here. One thing you might want to consider is to, is to tick um, to only send people in your contacts or maybe only people respond to people within your company. The reason for this is if you um, have an auto response um, and a, a cyber criminal or attacker sends an email to your account, um, your auto response email might give the particular date um, that you'll, you'll be returning. So that gives them a whole window of time to, to basically target the attack as well as if you've combined a signature with all your contact details you're really giving away a lot of information about who you are and where your movements are going to be so definitely a good idea is to only respond to people in your contacts that's what that way it, that auto response will only go to to people that you know um, and any strangers won't get a response at all you can also take a look at the videos i created for gmail and google drive as this shows better ways you can, well, better ways you can protect your data, particularly with email, instead of sending attachments and then those files disappear out of your control, you can send links to Google Drive documents instead. Um, and in, in Google Drive as well, setting the right sharing permissions, especially for external sharing um, and who can access your files and make 
modifications. So these are some of the security features you should be implementing with your G Suite account. Uh, keep an eye out for a future video, which will be the G Suite Security Advanced Session, where we'll cover how you can prevent uh, spoofed and phishing emails from even getting to your staff's inboxes, uh, what you should be doing if your G Suite account is hacked or someone else's, what your incident response plan is, um, how you can know of problems before your users do by using G Suite status dashboard and alerts monitoring. Make sure you have a clear process for onboarding and offboarding staff. How you can protect your data with uh, data loss protection uh, rules. Um, configuring correct access for your IT admins. How you can enforce multi-factor authentication for everyone. Um, enabling and disabling Google services to protect your data. And finally, how you can have a secure standard operating environment by using Chromebooks with Chrome Enterprise. I hope this video has been uh, beneficial and by implementing some of these security practices, uh, you can stay very safe uh, in the future with your G Suite usage. Thank you.